Adam Gower here and welcome to the Gower Crowd podcast syndication in the digital age at GowerCrowd.com. Now, my guest today, a fellow called Spencer Hilligos at Madison Investing. And what really drew me to this fellow? First of all, I found him first on LinkedIn and took a look at his website. And actually, I like to sign up for everybody's email list. Right? I keep a collection and I read absolutely everything. And I was intrigued by his background coming from a tech world and now raising money for real estate investments around the country. So I decided to sign up for his newsletter. Well, the first thing that really stood out was that this wasn't a simple, here, give me your name and email address, which is what I advise all my clients to do. Get their name and email address first, and then you can ask for more information later. No, Spencer's sign-up form is a whole questionnaire. This thing is very, very carefully calibrated and structured. This gentleman is a serious player. Right? You can tell just from the way to get on his newsletter number one. So I do suggest go ahead, have a look for yourself. It's very interesting. And of course, quite apart from that, he has migrated from the tech world into the real estate industry. That is a in itself a very interesting migration. So that's what you're going to hear us talking about today is the overlap between tech and real estate and the process of moving from the tech world into real estate. Spencer is a very highly educated fellow, very interesting, You're going to love the conversation with him today. Now, in order to find out more about Spencer and to get links to him, to his website, and some other good stuff, go to gowercrowd.com, go to the podcast page, and be sure to sign up for my newsletter. I'm going to make it a lot easier for you, actually. <laughs> so just go to the subscribe button. All I'm going to ask for is your name, email address, if you're not already on it, and you will get access to weekly updates on the world of real estate crowdfunding. There is no other newsletter like it in the industry. Focuses exclusively on happenings in commercial real estate crowdfunding, as well as educational content that you get on Saturdays. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to serial tech entrepreneur turned real estate investor, Spencer Hilligos. Spencer, thank you so much. I have to pause so that I can find the gap in <laughs> the recording. I have to struggle to find it. So I look like I should probably have a clapperboard, you know, oh. like action, and then but then I can find it that way. What a pleasure seeing you. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, a little pre-podcast chat. We had a very interesting discussion about the overlay of tech, something that is second nature to you. In fact, not second nature, I would say it's actually your first language is the language of tech and the overlay between that and real estate. So let's explore that idea. I told you that I just got off a call with somebody who was struggling with the concept of crowdfunding, that this was some kind of a derogatory in the world of real estate capital formation, some kind of derogatory connotations. Mm. So tell me, just jump in, tell me just a little bit about your background. I would like to know what it means to be a tech guy, where you come from, what that does mean. But then tell me how you see crowdfunding and what, what does that mean to you when it comes to real estate? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, thank you, Adam, for having me on. Obviously, we've had really awesome discussions in the past, and I'm just honored to, to get the invite to be here. So thank you for that. You know, I think it's a blast to nerd out on these topics, obviously. So for a little background on me first. Um, I grew up in Silicon Valley, um, and so that's where I started my career as well. Uh, you know, I was in technology companies for 13 years. Um, just a year ago, uh, almost down to the day, I quote unquote, you know, retired from that career in, in leadership roles across five different software companies. And now I just full-time real estate investor. Um, and, and I've been building our own company, Madison Investing on nights and weekends and where we help people invest uh, passively in, in real estate syndications, particularly in storage and multifamily. And so all of that said, I am also now encouraged to tell people upfront that um, I, you know, I used to be embarrassed about this, Adam, but now I'll just tell them that I actually grew up in a real estate household as well. 
Um, and so I technically was exposed to the real estate world at the ripe old age of six. I don't think that counts necessarily in terms of meaningful experience. But I think uh, when I was a, a teenager, for example, I was doing open houses in very, very large and nice looking homes. And so I got a real good taste up front of what kind of the residential side was like and brokering. But I also just brief as a brief aside, um, I also saw what it's like when a business rises and then later crumbles because my dad was a very successful broker in the 90s. And I got to see working inside that business what it was like when it goes well. And then we went through some tough stuff and then it crumbled and it bounced back later. But all that stuff matters because not to go TMI on people. It's important to understand the different strategies that are out there and how they can insulate your family, your livelihood, your business, what have you from all the market forces that at play, you know? And, and I think that uh, syndication is one example uh, and, and asset classes with, you know, that we focus on multifamily storage, et cetera. These are ways that I look at insulating financially a family, our family, others' families from the volatility in the market. Um, and so as before we kind of just jump into nerding out on, on um, you know, crowdfunding and syndication and all this wonderfully fun stuff, I just wanted to mention those things because these days I get to wake up every day, talk to investors, uh, both new to syndications and those that are deeply experienced LPs that are deploying capital, you know, with very large six or seven digits every year. I get to do that every day and it's an absolute blast. So, then, you know, thank you for giving me a chance to, to kind of tell my story with a little TMI on top of it. Well, the TMI actually is very interesting because one of the biggest hazards of crowdfunding and the way that the world has changed since the laws changed, allowing investors, let's call, them, let's call it retail investors, high net worth, nevertheless, retail investors to invest mm -hmm. in real estate is lack of experience. And the, my personal view, Spencer, of, you know, I think that there are some tremendous hazards actually being completely open book about it with crowdfunding the biggest one is that the danger of a downturn until you actually go through one you simply cannot understand how actually risky it is right? unlike a stock where you can invest in a stock if it goes down you know chances are it's if it doesn't come back if you've got legs you can but real estate can be wiped out Right. If you don't, if you get it wrong, you can be wiped out. So what lessons have you applied to what you do today based on what you saw during the 90s when you were growing up and saw these these big waves at home? How, how have you adapted that to the world that, that you live in today? Gosh, that is, that's like the question, right? I, I really believe both from those early learnings, being in a real estate business growing up, um, as well as my technology career that, you know, the best kind of boring, as corny as that sounds, is really what I'm going for. Meaning predictability is what is, is what you're solving for. And there's a couple different ways you can really solve for that and, and, and mitigate risks. You can't, you can't ever hope to mitigate all risk in any investment or business plan for that matter. However, mm. take, take tech, for example, um, five different software companies I spent time at. The first one was, was a biggie, you know, I was at Intuit, very fortunate, you know, to have gotten my first five years in the corporate world, working at a company of that caliber and set a long 20 year track record at that time and all that stuff. But then I went to tiny companies, early stage, you know, like series A stage, you know, funding round, like young companies with tons of potential, you know, it's the stuff that you hear about for, um, you know, some of them, three of them ended up becoming those, those unicorns, you know, worth at a billion dollars or more. And, an observation I had there, and I learned this from people far smarter than me, Adam. I mean, I, I always felt like I was always surrounded by these brilliant people, academic badasses and, and, and professional badasses. And, and I, I observe what are, the, what are the ways they think and make great decisions to mitigate volatility. And, and one of those ways is frameworking. And frameworking, it's just, it sounds so ethereal until you get specific. So I'll, I'll be very specific. Um, when you're building a software company from the ground up early, you know, I was on the business side to be clear with folks out there, there's business folks and tech folks. And by tech folks, what I mean in tech is software builders. I, I haven't written a line of code since I was in AP computer science in high school, Adam. So I, I, I'm, I'm an operations guy on the business side. I'm one of those darn business people as software developers would say. So I hired and managed and grew processes for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of transactions in my last company, which was Lending Home. Lending Home was, by the way, not only the biggest fix and flip lender in the country. And when I got there, they were doing 150 single family flips per month. When I left, we were up to about 600 transactions per month. And 
Um, they were also a crowdfunding platform and you could buy pieces of their loans and you could still do that now. I'm not getting paid to say any of this stuff. I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, it's, it's, and, I, and I think they have a good product. Um, however, uh, I learned a lot about not only underwriting, but the power of that framework and to make great decisions quickly because most, most great decisions are made slowly. And, but, you, but you don't have time to do that and to and deliberate long time in a startup. You have to make just fat, great decisions quickly. How do you do that with a framework? So, so what I applied in our own business for every deal that we looked at, purely when we were starting as LPs, as passive investors, before we even started doing any kind of equity capital raising or, or co-sponsoring in, in, the, in the syndication world, I put together a five-part framework for vetting sponsors or operators in real estate deals, which was you look at their track record, you look at their team. I'm using my finger gestures. The podcast listeners are missing out. So number one, track record. Number two, team. Number three, approach. Um, you're looking at number four, comms or communications. And number five, as corny as this might sound to some of the very the heavy quants that are out there, I look at values. And um, I can, I'm always happy to go into detail as to how you actually test for that. But the framework for each of those buckets has like six to seven different specific questions that are that, that will help me evaluate if I'm getting to know a sponsor. Are they going to be capable of navigating headwinds, volatility, dips in, in the market, all those wonderful things. So frameworking is the key. Uh, and it just depends on, are you learning from that over time? Are you applying it consistently? Are you adhering to those principles? Uh, all that good stuff. But absolutely, uh, absolutely fascinating. So it's putting structure on something that actually is very complex. So you can break it down into its individual components. And you know, I also, I'm not, a, I'm not a software guy. I've done the exact opposite. Actually, what you've done, I've gone from real estate into digital marketing. But you can apply code to that, a code to that structure and process so that at the end of it, you are given a, a rating, if you like, a conclusion that you're able to determine, is this a pass? Or is it a fail or is it somewhere in between? But I am interested, Spencer, I know you kind of glossed over this, but this is one that in all my years in real estate, I have, I have only intuited, if that's the right word, and that is testing for values. Mm. I've never consciously thought, what are this sponsor's values? Mm. Uh, I do think about them, though, just as I sit here and talk about it. I look, I think about integrity, honesty. I look for telltale signs around what they're saying of cracks in integrity, a willingness to do something small and unethical. To me, implies a willingness to do everything and I like am I being treated ethically am I behind am I in front or behind of that screen that's so right. tell me a little bit because that's really interesting tell me how you quantify that you talked about quants so how do you quantify that or measure it in any way yeah you know and I'm happy to speak to it you know so there, there's a concept which is certainly not one I, I claim. Uh, it, it was created by many, many, many other smart people many, many years ago. Um, if, you're, if you've ever hired anyone in a corporate setting, it, there's a good chance you've heard of uh, something called behavioral interviewing. And behavioral interviewing in its simplest form simply just means instead of saying an open-ended question or asking someone an open-ended question like, like, Adam, tell me why you want this job, you know, that, that there's really no way to test up against that very well. I mean, besides just the gut feeling, whatever people might say, you can't, you can't really test that very well. Um, behavioral interviewing means you want to hear, tell me about a time when blank. And people, it, it, everyone probably hears that it sends shudders down your spine because if you've been through an interview, that's a tough interview, that's a good interview, they've asked you that kind of question. And so, because they're hard, you have to recall details. Until and like a time when what? Give me an example of, of what that looks like. Tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time you've had to evict a tenant, and ah, how did okay. you approach that in a compassionate manner? And and, and even better, how, tell me about a time you had to evict a tenant, and it was hard, but you felt like it went well. And if I were to ask them how it went, they would say that they were treated compassionately. And you know, it's qu questions kind of like that. I don't know if that's the best one. I was just coming up with that. That's one a good example. Right? Um, okay. Another one, you know, would, and a real one that I've actually asked many sponsors before, and it's actually been the, the determinant as to whether or not we choose to partner with a sponsor, is walk me through your philosophy on tenant relations. 
And that is something in COVID that has had increasing relevance because now more than ever, if you are not actively communicating with your tenants and you were going deeper into this, I mean, very unfortunately, we're going deeper into COVID right now. So we're, we're seeing a second wave. We're seeing closures again. We're seeing people, you know, we're probably not far off from another shelter in place, all, all this stuff. So that matters a lot. And you can't just go out and, and play the hardball with, with your tenants. So it matters to me before we put our capital and also put a project in front of our passive investing group from a sponsor that we're going to join that this person understands compassion and being able to actively collaborate with your tenants is going to be the difference between navigating a hairy situation, which has yet to be resolved across the whole world, literally, um, and, and probably losing, blowing up the entire deal. So anyways, I don't want to go too macro too fast, but, but, but those, those would be a couple of examples. It's like testing. Okay. For so, so are you okay kind of drilling down on this idea a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, how do you then balance the the investor interests mm. with the management of a property? I mean, how, it's, this is a very, very difficult time right now, and in history, almost unique. Apart from maybe well, right, the Spanish flu, of whenever it was, nineteen eighteen or nineteen nineteen, whenever it was. But um, so, so, what are you looking for there? Are you looking? Are you? But tell me what you're looking for. Like, you, presumably you've spoken to a lot of people. Mm. Uh, and give me some examples of answers that benefit the investors first and not the tenants that make you uncomfortable. And how do you then represent that to investors? To say, look, you know, we're going with this sponsor because he's going to put you, I don't know, it's just tough. I'm just interested to know how you work that. Very hard for me now. Yeah, well, and I also think that, you know, keep in mind, um, most investors don't necessarily care about, like, or go, they don't care to go to this level of depth. They, they, they primarily want to just know that, first and foremost, their capital is preserved. That is still their number one thing, you know, because we're talking about an investment. If it was a donation, we we're just doing something that was a nonprofit, then that would be quite different. It'd be like all tenants all day. But we are, we are still talking about investments, of course. So, I would say that that is still the first question is like, what actions are you taking proactively in a, in a pandemic to ensure my capital is preserved? And that comes down to occupancy rates, rental premiums. And, and, and you're talking about um, keeping the building full. And most of the projects that we have done are, uh, are value add. And so you're trying to buy, you know, basically buy something and add some value with rehab or operational improvement and then sell it at a later time or do a cash out refinance just to return capital to investors and make everyone happy, um, all that good stuff. And so ideally, you know, you're able to go back with this. I can go back to our investors with a straight face and say, you know, cause, cause they were curious, like back in April, for, for example, um, when like peak fear in the market and many people asking about like, oh my gosh, like what do we have to worry about? You know, as an LP, as, as an investor in, you know, in a multifamily in particular, cause we, these days we focus uh, primarily on uh, storage facilities where you don't necessarily have people living in the units and in, in non-climate controlled storage facilities. And so uh, we do have- uh, Let's hope not. It, that, that's <laughs> okay. it is, we shall see what the future brings. <laughs> that's right. uh, and um, I'm glad, our humor is very similar, Adam. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think on April, just having a proactive plan and communicating what that plan is, is really the only thing that makes the difference. And, that's, and it, that, that, that's it. That is the key. And, you know, we've just, it's funny, actually, I just completed a, uh, an investor survey. It was a macro survey. So we sent out 40,000 <laughs> surveys and we aggregated all the responses. And we did some interviews as well. And the number one response that we had, it was, wasn't COVID related. But number one was principle preservation yeah. and communication. And you've said it multiple times. As long as the sponsor is communicating with everybody, including the investor, everybody knows that these are tough times. Yeah. You're not expecting sponsors or anybody to perform miracles. Right. You know that everyone's going to be struggling. So, but as long as there is communication, between the sponsor and the investors. Look, you know, this is what's going on. We're trying to figure it out. We're working our way through this like everybody else. We're looking at best practices. This is how we're doing. 
rents are down, but we've got good debt. So right, as long as there's communication, where it fails is when they go quiet. Yes. <laughs> That's the worst yes. possible situation, right? And there's no communication and there's nobody answering emails and no one picking up the phone. That's the worst thing you could do. Exactly right. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> let yeah, proactive. They didn't proactive, them. exactly. Proactive communication. All right, so let's move to the topic that I'm really interested in talking about. And that is crowdfunding and the interface between, and you said it so beautifully when we were chatting before, right? I told you, I got off a call right before now where a prospect had asked me, had said, we still need to get over the idea that what we're going to be doing is crowdfunding. Right, these guys are multi-billion dollar fund. They just, the, the whole idea to them is, has negative connotations. And what you said, you asked me, it was so perfect that you would ask me this. You said, what, what do you mean by that? Were they, did they understand, or did they, were they connected? The problem with crowdfunding was that it was website and with a funnel and good social media. It was like, what was the problem that they were experiencing? Mm. So it, not really that, as I said. And what I try to tell people is that crowdfunding is nothing more than syndication. It's the same that you've done for the last hundred years, basically, in real estate. It's all it's ever been. It's the same thing, except instead of doing it in person, you're doing it online, which makes you a thousand times more effective than having to do every meeting. Either. So tell me something about your view of how, because you've come into real estate when this has been okay right to do it it's been the, it's the new norm but for you it's natural it's your first language so what's your experience of what crowdfunding is and why do you think it's why does it have negative connotations with it? gosh that's a great question you know i mean we chatted briefly before this but just to say for your listeners as well it's just a fun conversation um and i love talking about this stuff so um i also want to demystify a concept first which is you know, terminology is a challenge, no matter what industry you're in. Um, as a guy who has hopped three industries, including things as, as glamorous as, you know, payroll tax, <laughs> as a prior software company I worked at, you know, acronyms galore. And, and you've got so much, so many terminologies. So in real estate, I, my previous company in the W2 world that I, I, I you know, left a year ago, they actually were a, a technically a crowdfunding company on one side at Lending Home. And so, you, you know, you could buy, uh, you could go in, confirm you're an accredited investor, it's verified, and then you could invest in their product. Um, similar to the many others, I mean, I, I, I told you this before, Adam, uh, months ago, but like, I really appreciate the content that you put out there ranking different crowdfunding platforms. So when I hear crowdfunding, it, it, I, I actually, I, I have not brought up that term uh, a single time in the, in the three to four years that we've been building Madison Investing because I, I put crowdfunding, although, although the mechanics are the same or similar, um, now, now that I'm actually also like a registered securities professional, you know, a, fin, a FINRA member, that also means that that actually literally is a different type of regulatory exemption. So it's a different style of deal, but it, it helps demystify it sometimes for explaining it to people. So I can totally appreciate why why you use it in that context. So, so what I what I try to think about is, you know, technology is just a way to connect people, and when I look at all the wonderful ways I, I grew up professionally in the world of operations and sales. Here's the table stakes things that, that I, I expect, both as an employee and a, and a professional, but also as a, as a consumer, as an investor and consumer myself. If I'm about to deploy capital with someone, I expect they have, number one, a, a, a clean web presence. They have a website that looks great. And it doesn't just look great, it's functional. You know, it, it's actually uh, easy to find the information that I need to make an informed decision. And Do you really? Do you really? That's that's. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that is fascinating to me. As it, so, why is that important? Why do you not want to get on the phone with them? And it's a dumb question, I know, but it's. I'm I'm being totally serious. I'm thinking from the other perspective. Yeah. Right? The developer who's resistant to this idea, as an investor, why? Why, why do you not want to say, hey, look, you know, if I'm going to invest with you, I want to get on the phone with you. I want to learn it from your mouth like in live. I want to get on the phone. Tell me, tell me about that. Yeah, and, and here, here's probably where I'm going to lose uh, the favor with a, 
a great many sponsors and I'm, I, and that's okay. I'm not here to land friends. I'm, I'm here to <laughs> earn, your, earn your respect. So if you have an AOL.com address, I don't, I probably am not going to take your meeting. You know, if, if, if you don't have a website, uh, you come across as closed minded, stodgy, and just frankly, I hate to say it this way, it, as outdated. I mean, it, it's just, it's your calling card. Like within, within less than 10 seconds, and I'm not even the fastest person out there. I'm I, in the tech world. I'm considered an, a, a dinosaur, guys. I'm 37. So like, <laughs> and I'm not. I'm totally not exaggerating, by the way. Like, I know it's so funny. And so, I, if I go to your website and I can't find what you do, how you do it, who's on the team, which is a common problem I'm seeing very frequently with a lot of real estate folks, is they hide the team, which speaks volumes and makes me run away immediately and try to hide. <laughs> but it, you know. It, most of the purchase, so a stat that started floating around about five, six years ago, Adam, at least in the tech world, and it was relevant for building sales funnels and sales groups and sales organizations in tech, is that consumers in a B2C context have done at least 60. I think the number's gone up since then, so I, don't quote me on this. I can't source the data, um, but I would say at the time, it was 60% of the information and the decisioning is done before someone talks to a company to consider buying their product. So the role of a salesperson from the 1950s to the role of in 2020 and 2021 is fundamentally a different game. I mean, you're, it's your job to establish a real relationship. So the website the, and social media, which we, we can certainly get to in a moment, mm. it, it, the role of it is not to replace, at least for our model, I, I, I want to have a very real relationship in the real world with 100% of the people that we work with, and we do. Um, I take three to six months to get to know the sponsors before we're willing to put our own money in and also put them through a background check and all this wonderful stuff and even call them friends. But our investors, they will hit our website because I need to know some compliance information about them because I'm a registered securities professional. So that means that I'm held to a bar that I willingly put myself um, to, to be held to. And I got to know, are they actually, you know, based in the United States? You know, are, are, are they, um, are, are they uh, not, not uh, what are they called? Bad actors? financially, you know, all, all these things. And, and I want them to know that about me. You know, so, so we got, we have to know about their goals, their, their objectives, their backgrounds, all this wonderful stuff, because in the end, no matter which type of exemption that, you know, that, that you use, whether it's 506 C, 506 B, these different syndication deals, uh, your partners, like an, an investor literally is called a limited partner. And, and, and I take that quite literally. I know a lot of folks out there, um, you know, to kind of bridge this whole topic of, of what might sound impersonal, to the old school folks who say like, oh, I'm a people person. I, I would challenge them that that excuse maybe stopped working five to 10 years ago. Um, have, having a website, having a social media presence, it's how you connect with more people to then go build the human relationship. Being a people person is no longer a valid excuse for not having a, a reasonable tech representation of yourself on the, on the internet. Well, on the contrary, you know what's on the contrary? Being a people person, look, this is the way I, I see this. This is why I find this so incredibly exciting. <laughs> this opportunity yeah. to, to communicate online. If you are a people person, you want to make it as easy as possible for your prospects to learn who you are. You want to, you want to I'm trying, I'm fiddling with my phone only so that I can waft it in front of you. So, hey, I'm showing my phone. Can you tell who, can you, do you know who that is? Oh. It's Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin. Yeah, it's my, my screen saving, that lovely. But, love the, but the way that people communicate, it's what I tell pros, my prospects these days, what I tell sponsors, is that you might be a really nice guy, I'm sure you are, but no investor wants to sit down as much as you think they might. Yeah. Wants to sit down with you for two hours to hear your pitch during the first meeting. They don't want to do that as little, as much as you don't actually want to do that either. Yes. You don't want to sit down. For so digitize it. Give them that information. If you're a people person, make it easy for them to yeah. get to know you. That's that 60% that you're talking about, the decision is 60% of the way. That's amazing that you use that number, actually. 60% of the decision is made before first contact. I'm not sure if that's quite what you said. Yes, but when you meet somebody the first time, they have a good digital presence. They, 
not just, by the way, you did say calling card. So I'm going to beg to differ on that with you. Having been somebody that spent his entire life collecting business cards, especially yeah. when I was in Japan, I had stacks and stacks of the bloody things, right? And my secretary filed them and it was like old performance. A website needs to be more than a business card because a business card has a logo, maybe a picture, unlikely, an address, a name, a phone number, and an email address. It is non-functional. Yes. A website today needs to do more, doesn't it? What does a website today need to do? Tell me about that and how that rolls into social media. Yeah. And I, you know, although you beg to differ, I, I think you more elaborated and educated so well on that front because you're right. 100% right. I still have literally a stack of business cards sitting here getting very dusty, not only because, <laughs> but because the only time you ever physically need one these days is maybe you go to a conference, but people give them back. Like you go to conferences, people don't want them. Uh, since I've given, I do not do business cards. I'm going to show you something now. I've got, I've got a, uh, I've got a collection here of all my old business cards. There's one I'm trying to find when I was at Universal Studio. I ran Universal, a joint venture of Universal and Paramount when I was in Tokyo uh, in the 90s. And I'm trying to find that one. You know what I'm going to do with my business cards? I'm going to get one of those old frames that you used to be able to get for baseball cards, are they? Yeah, I remember those. And I'm going to, I'm going to put them all like an antique. <laughs> it's now become art. Why do you need? Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's kind of a cool um, idea, though. Right? It's the tapestry of your life. So. Why do you need it? I, you know what? If you want to know about me, this is my website address. Go there. It's all there. Right? Oh. That's, that's all you need. Well, anyway, I, sorry, I cut you off. But go ahead. No, but I, I want to answer your question because it's such a fun one to talk about. So in, the, in a review of a website, I mean, if you think about it, right? Like, let's say I, uh, you're just getting to know me and you're going to our website at madisoninvesting.com. Like, when you hit that website, you're going to want to know answers to... Who, what, where, when, why, how. Basic stuff. I mean, everyone knows those, you know, they know those words in that context for just doing discovery of some sort. Call it whatever you want. Research, discovery, due diligence, the rest. And you have a chance now, I mean, literally on your phone, you have in your pocket. Like, like, like the, the resources to do something like recording a video of you explaining, here's who I am in 30 seconds. Here's what my business does. Here's why I, here, here's some reasons to believe in why we do, in why I think you should do what we do with us. All of that can be done literally with the phone you have in your pocket. You don't need a recording studio. And so <laughs> at, over time, sure, you, maybe you want to invest in a couple of very polished ones. But I mean, if you don't like that, you can even hire people that are now based in a totally different country who would be happy to do animated videos for a very reasonable price, which would probably shock most people. So the website needs to answer those questions in less than a minute. And if it doesn't do that, they're gone. You, and, and you, you, you would look at our website and you'd say, okay, I, well, if they can't figure out how to do this well, then how are they going to figure out how to do something as sophisticated as manage a $40 million real estate project? <laughs> it's not so. incredible. That is such, that is an interesting perspective. Because I think that the, the struggle that sponsors have is that it's so far removed from managing the plumber and the framer and, you know, the, uh, the, the, the bank and the debt and all the other stuff that we're doing, signing leases and whatever we're doing. The, the step from that, that again, you've got to remember, you, like, you come into this from the world of tech. Yes. But you're talking to a world that is ancient, right? the real estate is ancient and has never really used these tools. And so there's this mentality that says, why, how, do, first of all, why do I need it? And then how the heck am I going to do that? It's overwhelming. That's the other thing. And you can, might make the case that somebody that does do it well, just playing counter to this idea, if somebody's really kicking backsides with their website, their social presence, etc. Aren't they, are they spending too much time on that and not with the plumber? Right? They're just, all they're doing is marketing. So shouldn't I be concerned about that? And I'm not sure if that's how investors think, but I know that it's not. But I think that sponsors can't imagine being distracted from right. their daily routine to like 
now learn the business of digital marketing. You've, you, you, you said it right at the beginning of our conversation. You retired from tech. You can't want a sponsor to retire from real estate to mm -hmm. learn how to do this. But how do they make that step, do you suppose? You know, um, like, have you, let me put it a different way, actually, Spence. Sorry to interrupt. You know, if, have you come across a really good sponsor who has a really lousy online presence and been thought, oh, I'm so glad that I looked a bit closer? You know, I haven't found, th I mean, thankfully, I haven't had a sponsor that we've evaluated whether they whether we said yes to them in our vetting process or, or decided not you know, not to and pass on them, I haven't encountered one that that was truly like bad. Um, I, I have encountered some where, uh, like like the other day, someone reached out and they asked if we would be interested in partnering on a project. And I looked at their website and that example I brought up from earlier about the who was was real. Um, I, I I could not find a team and. I, you know, coincidences, I, as much as I'd like to say that they are frequent, they aren't. Um, th th there's really not a whole lot of coincidence. And so you're telling me a person is smart enough to launch a real estate syndication business, but they're not smart enough to understand and have self-awareness that they can put a photo of it or a headshot on a website. <laughs> they're not putting it there because they don't want to show people that. So I hate to say it, but I was like, you know what? I think we're, we're, we're full up right now on our on our commitments and, and we'll have to just part ways and, and, and I wish you the best of luck. I'll be cheering for you from the sidelines. So, you know, it, it, it's um, those types of moments where it even looked clean, you know, it looked professional enough because you can go to any number of those sites that we all know, like, like Wix.com, Weebly.com, um, the, these websites that are relatively turnkey, but then even if you go do that, you still have to invest the time and care and business, have a sense of layout, design style, yada, 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 yada. So if you don't want to do any of that stuff, you do need a partner and, and you, you will need someone to help out and do that. Thankfully, though, there's a lot of people to help. So yeah. Exactly. And I was actually going to, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Things popped up. Uh, and I was actually going to, I was actually going to ask you, presumably you see a lot of people like that. I was going to say, anytime you I'll give you a nickel for everyone you send in my direction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. I want a nickel. And then you might, then, then, then we'll uncover, maybe we'll find some diamonds, right? Out there in the rough. You never know. Uh, it's an old industry and it's been untapped so far. Well, but, but I will give you a, like, I'll give you one very real, very positive example about sure. um, our current, one of our current partners, uh, we closed on a deal with them very recently. They have incredible competency within real estate. And, and, and it's not fair to say, um, I, I would actually say that they are very tech savvy. Um, they're, they're very tech savvy. However, they have deliberately focused on, you know, capital markets. They have focused on operations. They have focused on an acquisition engine for the assets that they target in real estate. And they are very good at that. They have not deliberately gone out and made big pushes because even if you have a clean website, that doesn't mean anyone's going to find the thing. I mean, the, the, the ancient example that I would have brought up even a decade ago, and I think it still applies now. I mean, if we're having a conversation about you know, like the, the level 101 conversation as to how do search engines work and is a, a URL of a website is like a billboard in the desert. You know, it's, it, it really is that. And if you don't know how to get people to it, it's not that useful. And so all of those things matter because this partner of ours, you know, they, they deliberately said, this is going to be a great fit for me to go and join them in a GP on multiple deals, because not only are we going to help on things such as the equity capital raise and the investor relations side, there's going to be a, a learning process and a mutual benefit um, of just helping with things like such as webinars and such as things that, you know, in terms of um, building recognition for, for the projects that we're doing online and all these things. So I just wanted to share that because it doesn't always come across as so dire where it's like, like, cause, cause these, I also don't want this to be snarky because, because the intent is not, um, I, I will say that the best learning lessons are typically ones that hurt the most. So I will just say, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this is the right kind of sting. If you're sitting out there kicking the can down the road about, oh, I don't want to go build my social presence. Oh, I don't want to go build a website. Just do it. You know, it's, it, it's, it's really not, not that hard if you hire the right partner. I'm probably talking to one right now, by the way. And, and so, and so um, I, j j just go do it. But it is critical. And, and you are late to the party. <laughs> <laughs> 
we 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 have to talk for hours and hours. I mean, I want to make a thousand uh, pieces of content from this one. I just did a I did a podcast last week. We created thirty three pieces of content out of that. I'm going to see if I can beat it because you are singing my song today. I'll tell you. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny that you talk and we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately, because I do have a call at the top. That's what that annoying noise was. I'm so sorry. And the time has flown by, Spencer. I can't it believe it has. So let's uh, I've got three sign off questions I want to ask you. But before we do that, and I'm so sorry that we can't talk for longer. Truly, I really am loving understanding for you as a tech guy your perspective, because it's absolutely fascinating to me. Um, so SEO and social media. So you've talked about the, I know it's a big topic. We just yeah. have to gloss over it, unfortunately. But talked about the website, the importance of having an informative website. When somebody lands there, they're grabbed, and there's every, all, I'm going to put a little bit of words into you. Sure. All the questions that you might have as an investor are answered on yeah. that website. So you can spend your time there learn who it is, make your decision about whether or not you want to connect, right? It's very important. <clears throat> but what is the importance of social media? How does that yeah. dovetail into this? Just explain that to you. Okay? At a high level, it's, it's so easy to get lost in which platform and frequency and type of content. I would just remind folks that it helped me immensely and hopefully it does for them too, to think about it like this. That is your chance to build a relationship on, on more of a, an introductory level and for them to hear your take on things. And, you know, we have focused, prim, um, our, our number one, and by our, I mean me and my co-founder, Jennifer Mormoto, um, we, have, we focus on LinkedIn as our number one social media platform. Some people say you got to be everywhere. I actually disagree with that very strongly. I, th I think that the more you spread yourself thin, the less that you get deep, meaningful, engaging content. So LinkedIn is great. And I think that um, we, and just to give you a specific example, Adam, briefly, uh, people on there now have a sense as to like, how do I view topics such as financial literacy, personal development, entrepreneurship, we occasionally get to crack some bad jokes and, and dry humor, similar to the style that both you and I laugh about. You know, and humanizing that thing, people want to engage with you that way. What they don't want to do is have you say, let's set up a call, stranger. Oh, that's right. You have done some of that. Right. And, you know, link to that's right. Isn't that ridiculous? Well, and it's just so funny. Funny. Yeah. It's a great example, right? Because all, <laughs> every day you receive, I, I, you, pro you probably receive, I receive, Dozens of people, see some, some of which are bots, but many people are quite serious, like, like they're in a, a title role within a company and they're saying, hey, great to connect. When can we set up some time? And I was like, yeah. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know why you want to talk. I'm not against it. I'm a pretty friendly guy. Um, but, but just why are we even speaking? Like, are you trying to solve a problem for me? Are, are you curious? And even better is when they reach out and they say, um, you know, well, tell me about your business. I'm very curious. And, and I'm like, you know, it's, it's these moments where people can smell these days. People are sophisticated these days. They don't want to be sold to the same way. They know you don't, you're not curious. They know you're trying to hit your number. And so they just want to know, is it really you? And is it really you? Are you authentic? Are you putting real stuff out there? And, and, and that is your chance. It's the same as the cocktail party, man. It is the new cocktail party. And, and if you're not on there you're missing that party and it feels like you're going straight to try to go to the wedding and, hit, <laughs> and get hitched with someone <laughs> that is funny it's so true gosh uh that uh, the linkedin you know so it's interesting actually getting off that because that is a pet gripe and i just don't pay any attention to it occasionally i do get outreach that resonates in fact i'll tell you one time just briefly and we are out of time unfortunately i just i hate to do this let me just you know, I am going to just send a quick, can we start a few minutes later? Uh, can we start? You know, I'm going to ask actually at cool. 11 men's past. Running late. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this on a podcast. Uh, I've actually got a call coming up, but here's why I'm doing it. Because if we start 11 minutes later, not to kill the evergreen nature of this conversation, which is what it is, I'm going to date stamp it. If my next call starts 11 minutes later, it's going to be on. 11 11 at 11 11. Ah, there <laughs> we go. Let's see if I'll get a yes on that. And we'll good luck. Buys you and me a few more minutes. 
Um, but the but the thing with with LinkedIn is that occasionally. Oh no, that's what I was going to say. SEO. So yeah. I when I first started on this journey, I interviewed a fellow called Jeff Bullis, who's uh, is I don't know. He's like a, he does I think a hundred posts on Twitter a day. Crazy guy. Wow. And he mentioned to me the power of SEO. This is about two years over two years ago, two three years ago. And I had no idea. And that same day, a guy on LinkedIn said something to me, not shall we chat or something. He said something to me about SEO. So I said, sure, why not? And he did an analysis of my website. And what was important about that, how he scored, it was really interesting, was that he actually understood what I was doing. Oh, it sounds crazy. And he found competitors who were really true mm-hmm. competitors in the field. I just thought this guy really got it. I actually took him on, hired him, and now my SEO is uh, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, actually. Yeah. So that, but but it's, so the point I'm making is that LinkedIn is, and social media is, a great way to yeah. make connections if you use the tool properly. That's right. That's the key, isn't it? Yeah. And it's an extension of your website. That's how we use it, basically, like tentacles that are out there. I think of it actually like gravity. I think of the website as a center of gravity and the ring around it is social media. And that kind of draws people into right towards the gravity of your website points in the right direction. And then the next layer around that I think of as marketing, right? Webinars. Now you go out, you're reaching even further beyond. Yeah. And people are being drawn in. And once they, you know, once they see your website, you know, you've got them. You're great. And and just briefly on that, I know we're on on borrowed time. The 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 where I see people stop short of finding a of finding greatness on on their chosen social media platform is they really want to get those. It's, it's it's almost like I can think back to a corporate meeting when you're talking to someone who is pure quant and they don't understand strategy behind business and acquisition and go to market and and they're saying, but I can't measure it. I can't measure the cost of acquisition for that single lead. How, why are we investing so much time into, into our LinkedIn profile, into our Instagram profile, into our Facebook profile? And you try to tell them, you're not going to see some, I do a post and suddenly a 20 leads flow in. That's not how this works. And it, so it's a top of funnel, and not to use the marketing lingo too much, top of funnel, mid funnel, bottom of funnel. It, it touches all aspects of that. We've had active investors that are with us currently who have done three to four different investments they are they're they are for, they forget they're busy they're, they're living their life they see a post they remember oh yeah i really wanted to go invest a hundred thousand dollars with these guys this year that's the role it plays in one specific way yes so it's uh you know as folks just need to step back and get away from the very transactional ethos and then then they'll get in the right headspace to start approaching it i think it helped me a lot to hear that spencer that is a brilliant insight and that is an insight that comes from a tech guy who is now in real estate. Because what you're talking about, this is my experience, one of the hardest challenges that we have building these systems is describing the ROI. Because it's not like you're selling a widget. I can't advertise on Facebook and spend $100 or $1,000 today and see 1100 come out at the end of the day because I'm selling a pen for yes. $20. Right, it's a long-term thing. So the 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 challenge, and I love the word quant. I know I'm going to start using that casually now. You know, people will think I know what it means because I've still got no idea really. But I'll <laughs> uh, but uh, it's the it's the way you quantify results from this process. You talk about cost of acquisition, but in order to really understand the value of digital marketing you have to keep in mind lifetime value of that acquisition so if you're spending let's say we figured it out actually we've been spending between a thousand and fifteen hundred to get an active investor of forty five thousand so that's about that's about a three to five percent cost now, if you think of it this way, and by the way, that's after you've built the mousetrap and you've got everything in place. That's the marketing that happens once you've built your system out, right? Your, yeah. your website, your social, and once you've got that going, you're going to run between 3 and 5% on a bad day. 
But the key is that that is for the first year. Yes, exactly. That, that investor who invests 45 on day one, 45,000 on day one, that cost you four, three to 5%. Next year, they might invest another 100. And over the course of their lifetime, you communicate with that investor properly. They might end up investing millions and the cost of acquiring that next investment is zero. Yes. Pay Almost zero. zero. It, exponential. You know, it, it's, it, it really can be. And it's the, you're, you're basically evaluating the cost to acquire the relationship, right? And that, that, that's what you're doing. It's not the deal. Correct. It's a tough, the tough mindset shift. I love <laughs> the way you said that. Cost of relationship, not cost of acquisition, right? Yes. Beautiful. Spencer, my 11 o'clock just wrote back and said, yes, 11, 11, 11, 11, good to go. So let me ask you in the, <laughs> in the last 11 minutes, actually 10, because I need to get off and then let her get in. Let me ask my three sign-off questions, if I may, okay. that I ask all of my guests. First, you're a very interesting fellow, so I'm dying to hear. What are your key daily habits? Three questions. So this is question number one. What are your key daily habits that make you successful? I think there's a, um, a giant whiteboard that I have I'm looking at it right now on my wall. And as simple as this might sound for a guy that uses, you know, four Gmail, four Google calendars integrated for our family and our business and all this other stuff. I still just have a big whiteboard. And on that big whiteboard, I write down the stuff that unflinchingly has to get done. And I, there, because si literally science, I get to use the benefit of science without referencing, but I'll say science has shown when you're physically write it down and cross it out, you're more likely to get it done. That type of stuff, right? So I use that, that habit has always served me well. And I, I'm a big believer in weekly wipe your whole calendar. Once you set your top three items that have to get done that week and you wipe, you adjust your entire calendar to serve those three objectives. And if you don't do that, you're actually not prioritizing well. And so I do those things. The other habit I would just say, which is daily now is, um, I, I, I run, I think, I think health and fitness, I'm not a health nut, but I do think I run a lot and, and I run and it's mentally clearing for me, helps me think through complex problems. Uh, I try to do a few 10 Ks a week and just listen to real estate podcasts whenever I can. And so, and, and books and audio books, it's the way I can actually still find time to uh, energy and time to read or listen, uh, you know, given that I got two young kids um, and, and then they take a lot of that energy and I want to save some for them too. So but that's it. <laughs> Beautiful. Actually, I'm going to sneak in a fourth one, but I should always ask a fourth question. And this is, Question one, part two. <laughs> Any recommended books? I've been reading like a fiend recently. Is it just kind of in general nothing that Yeah. Uh, you know, I will always say if someone hasn't done the quintessential uh, rich dad, poor dad, you, you always gotta start there. But but I think beyond that, essentialism is probably my most recommended book. I've read it three times. Hmm. Uh, essentialism is very in line with this whole notion of prioritizing correctly because it arms you literally with ways to say no with the verbiage you can use. And I think that is where most people miss on effectiveness and productivity, not, not being busy, but being productive. And because you're so interested in making sure that, you know, social grace basically beats out, um, you know, get, getting things done. And, and, and you would rather go take a coffee or have a lunch with someone than just simply say, I would love to rain check on that. Um, can we just come back on that while I go get this thing done? So essentialism is my big vote. <laughs> I'm so happy I asked you that. I should get that immediately. Lovely. I've got to love Amazon and overnight delivery. So I'll be reading that tonight. <laughs> Tomorrow. Second of my last three questions. What's the hardest lesson you what was the hardest lesson you learned in tech, in your tech career? Work is never done. It's never you can never complete. And it will eat your life. <laughs> I wish yeah. I asked you that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would say it, so many people, the headspace from being a full-time corporate employee of 13 years to being an entrepreneur who kind of carves his own calendar every day and week now is such a, there are two different planets. And the first planet, um, I, I would just say, you know, the, the way that you approach your work, the way that you approach, the way that you prioritize your time, the way that you think about um 
getting things done. Like I, that one of the reasons I, I'm in this entrepreneur track now, Adam, is because I hit a point where I was working like 80 to 100 hours a week in office at a certain startup. And it was when I had an infant son, you know, and, and so it, we don't have a lot of time to go into that stuff too much. Um, people don't want to hear that TMI, but I'll just say that, um, you know, work's never done. And, and I think that it, you have to stay very close to that notion and understand it because every hour you do over 40 as a W2 employee, you are giving free work. That, that is now my perspective. I used to be the guy who basically would always say, go for it team, make sure you put in all the effort that you can and I'll lead by example. Gosh, do I not believe that these days. <laughs> Just so, it's such a different ethos. <laughs> it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing you say that because one of the big seductions of the online world t- for me was the idea that was sold to me right when I first started learning about it was the idea that you can make money while you're on the beach, right? Or while you're asleep. Right. There is a curse that comes with that. And that curse is with all the funnels that I have out there, if I get an email, through one of them where I have super highly qualified someone, right? They've gone through a lot of steps before they filled out a form. When that email comes in, I have to jump. Yes, that's I right. I cannot wait. So in a way, it works so well that it, it can become inhibiting. I understand that it's from a slightly different perspective. You're always on. free you are. It actually makes, I don't know, it's kind of the same idea. Yeah, yeah, totally. But it's, it's the difference. Uh, I forget who said this, but it was like a modern professional development thought leader. Um, and he said something like, you know, stress has another form when you're, when, you're, uh, when you're actually interested in what you're doing. And it's called passion. And, um, and I, just, I butchered the quote, but... Um, <laughs> That's right. See if I can find it. But yeah, but you're basically just saying that like for an entrepreneur, you better like what you do because you're always doing it. And yeah, that's right. Yeah, I respond on the fly every day, I mean, Saturday, Sundays at night, in the morning. Um, got to do it. Gotta yeah. Do it. And when you build funnels, it's automated. So there's no control over when somebody contacts you. But they're always qualified. So that's a good thing. All that's right, last thing. question. <laughs> last question. So what would be the number one advice, piece of advice that you would give to any of those sponsors that may have an amazing track record and experience, but a zero online presence, right? That just are invisible online. What would be the advice you would give to them? I would take 10 minutes. If, if you can get it done in less, great. If you need more, take it. And I would write down what are the characteristics and qualities you want to be known for? And I would do that. And then I would go and find the youngest people that are over the age of 18 to 20 in your network and ask them how your online presence reflects these. And then buckle up. (laughs) Because that's really all the note of it. I mean, so much of it, all change only comes from self-awareness. And until you understand how far off the mark you are, no one's going to be open-minded. You could have the simplest, best playbook in the world that, that's worth you know millions of dollars on how to go through a scale of business. A, a, a uh, stodgy, resistant, closed-minded, old-school professional of any industry who thinks that it's a joke, well, I hope they don't waste their money on something because they're so closed-minded, they ain't going to do it. So I would encourage them to go hold up the mirror, as it were, to themselves first and reflect because that's actually where most people fail. <laughs> I'll start there. Spencer Hillegoss, CEO, Madison Investing. An enormous pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, This is so much fun, Adam. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. That was Spencer Hillegoss of Madison Investing. And what a fascinating conversation. I know you will agree with me. Be sure to go to gowercrowd.com to the podcast page for today's episode. Find more information about Spencer and about Madison Investing, as well as to access some of the short episodes, the uh, video segments that we put together so you can get to the highlights quickly. And while you are there at gowercrowd.com, be sure to sign up for my newsletter. There's a subscribe button, should be anyway, on every single page. Click that, sign up, get access to our Wednesday's newsletter that covers events in the real estate crowdfunding industry over the last week and our Saturday newsletter that includes 
educational content about real estate crowdfunding, whether you're an investor, developer, or have some other interest in the industry, it's all going to be there in those newsletters. You can always unsubscribe. Go ahead, check that out if you're not already subscribed. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much, Spencer. What a real pleasure getting to know you. Spencer Illigos, Madison Investing. I look forward to getting to know you better as time goes on. That is all for this episode. I'll see you next time. And in the meantime, stay well. And for now, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off.